everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews and presentations by members of the U.S. intelligence community who have great stories to tell. And today we have a great program with a very special guest. And to help me introduce today's program, permit me to introduce uh, Deborah Bonani. Deborah is a retired senior uh, officer from the National Security Agency, where she held a number of senior positions. And I'm pleased to say she is now a member of the AFIO board. Deborah, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you very much, Jim. And it's really a pleasure for me to be able to introduce a good friend uh, and a colleague of mine from NSA, Mr. Everett Jordan. Everett today is serving as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence Community Integration in the Department of the Treasury. He was named to this position in January of 2015, following his NSA career where he served over 30 years. Everett began his career in federal service as a Russian linguist in the Army, followed by assignments as both a Russian and Arabic language analyst at NSA. Throughout the course of his career, Everett served in various leadership positions, both at NSA and across the intelligence and national security community. Of special note, Everett served on the professional staff supporting the Joint House and Senate Intelligence Committee 9-11 Inquiry, and he was the founding director of the National Virtual Translation Center. Welcome, Everett. It's just wonderful to have you joining with us today. Thank you. Everett, I'm going to start by asking you just to tell us a little bit about the, the, your current role and the mission of your organization. While a lot of our FEO members and the public who might be viewing this um, probably know something about the partnership between Treasury and the IC, but probably not as deeply as uh, we need to. So if you could start by explaining your current role and your mission, I think that'd be a good way for us to start. Thank you, Deborah. And Jim, also thank you. I'm proud to be here and talk to you folks, you folks today about um, the job that I get to do down at the Department of the Treasury. And so I work within the Treasury's Office of Intelligence Analysis, OIA as we call it, and um, it's been quite an eye-opening experience for me in coming down there after having worked over at um, NSA with the DOD for so many years. We're part of the intelligence production cycle. We are um, a small part of the intelligence community. We're one of the, the smaller organizations. But we do have a, a, large, a large part to contribute, particularly when it comes to economic security and financial intelligence. So one of the bullets of my job description, as the um, we call them a DAS, as the DAS for Intelligence Community Integration, I need to read it to you because here's, it gives you an idea of what they've asked me to do. It says, oversees projects involving complex and sensitive national security, intelligence, foreign policy, and law enforcement problems for which established principles, techniques, guidelines, and precedents are not directly applicable and often do not exist. My job is about relationships, how to create them, how to build them, how to nurture the ones that are evolving, and always um, and try to um, determine the direction that we should be going in so far as the intelligence community is concerned. I get to maintain partnerships that are going on as well as represent us in places that we've never been before. Our intelligence process, our, excuse me, our intelligence products serve the needs of the um, Secretary of the Treasury on a daily basis, but they also serve the needs for our um, policy and national advisors on a much broader basis each day. The um, information that we do have to do with um, if something bad's going to happen in the world. When it's being planned, money has to flow from one place to another. And here's where we come in. We see that money going. We see who the players are. We get an understanding of what they do with that money and how they finance various activities, such as terrorist threats or whatnot. And we provide the necessary support to our policymakers. In this case, it would be the White House to determine if they want to do um, a sanction of a person or a state or organization. This is the very interesting part of being close to um, the policymakers that have not been part of before. In the past, you used to be just, you know, you do your job, you turn in your work, you send it up, up the chain, and you know that it's going to go downtown to the um, decision makers, and that's that, and then you're on to the very next thing. In our business, we see it going on at the highest levels. We receive reports from around the community. We put all that information together, and we work with the Office of Foreign Assets Control, known as OFAC, and also the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, known as FinCEN. These are our sister organizations that we work with every day. They are part of the organization in Treasury that we work with, 
And although they are not part of the intelligence community, we are the intelligence arm. And so it's a very interesting dynamic to have an intelligence piece there, but two very strong policy pieces um, also working hand in hand. And so I get to be part of that organization, providing what it is that we uniquely provide to the mission there at the Treasury Department. So when they asked me to do this, and they gave me an idea like, you know, sometimes established principles and techniques don't often exist. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that's that's the job I want, <laughs> um, because it fits in with the kinds of things I've been doing my entire career. And it gives me an opportunity to be creative, but also bring the um, the wealth of experience that I have to new situations, perhaps, and apply them as they uniquely need to be applied to Treasury, not to DOD, not to the agency, not to other places. So, Everett, as you're speaking, I, I'm I'm observing and thinking about the fact that it sounds as if this experience has really enhanced your understanding of the role of intelligence in decision making. But it also sounds as if your prior experience and you've served in a in a diversity of assignments across the IC, across the national security community. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, your prior assignments um, the, the way in which you've, you've served throughout the community, how that's helped you to really adjust to this different environment that you're in today. Yes. One of the things that a colleague of mine said to me about me many years ago, he says, Everett, outside your comfort zone is your comfort zone. You seem to be the kind of person that goes and does different things that not everybody would want to do. Um, and for the most part, you come out OK on them. And that's that's me. Um, I've always been happy to be hired to do a job and do that job to the best of my ability. But at the same time, I always felt I had more to offer the organization than perhaps what this job required. And working at NSA gave me the opportunity to branch out in other directions that I also had an aspiration to an avocation to and develop those at the same time. This was very, very helpful. Along the you know, now, I've been in the um, government service for 43 years, and so it's not that I did all of these things at the same time, but I did take the time and worked hard as a linguist. Really enjoyed that. Then I got to go into the technology field, where we did a lot for foreign languages online, how to use foreign language um, equipment, how to make sure it worked with the uh, stuff that we had before, and also working with the industry to create foreign language capabilities on everything that would come off. The, um, the assembly lines in those major corporations, things that we couldn't afford to build, but we had an opportunity to provide input as to how languages should be shown, how they could work with each other. That was really, really cool and fun stuff. I also got to be on the 9-11 um, inquiry, which enabled us to, which enabled me to become a professional staff member working on Capitol Hill. And I got to see how the sausage was made um, and working in Congress from that side of the street. Um, much, much different, very a different perspective altogether. And there I got to see or got to understand how something said on one side could be misconstrued by another side and then also bring politics into the, um, the matter. Because politics, it's all about politics when you're on Capitol Hill. And if you are a member of a staff, then you understand that staff's role and you play the role that, that, that you're given. And so that enabled me to en enact and um, um, interact with my colleagues in a very interesting and new way. And having done that for a year, I was pretty much satisfied that I didn't want to work as a professional staff member on Capitol Hill and wanted to go back to the safe confines of working within the DOD where everything is normal. So <laughs> um, not as crazy. So, um, but having done that, I mean, it was just so, so enriching to enable me to do that. Um, my next assignment was the founding director of the National Virtual Translation Center which was one of the outshoots of um, of our inquiry and in that the U.S. government had a need for foreign language translation capabilities that it did not have enough personnel for. And this included both the higher end stuff as well as the lower end stuff. And so my job was to put together a, um, a national capability to translate any and all foreign language materials that would come into the possession of the U.S. government, uh, regardless of priority and be able to handle them using translators who lived in all the 50 states. Um, I had to set up a process whereby we would um, be able to get the information to them and, and um, receive it from them um, to be billed uh, because I hired contractors and also work on several different um, classification levels. 
we were able to achieve this with the FBI as our um, executive agent. And so in doing that, I got to work with the FBI for four years very closely, understanding how the Bureau puts things together, um, how they uh, um, how they look at Intel and how they um, approach this kind of effort. The Bureau had the best model for me to follow on that and that they already had a nationwide network set up. My issue was I couldn't use Bureau resources. I had to go out and find my own. And so I got to work with the um, language um, translation profession nationwide. And I got a lot of stories I could tell for the things that I learned there, but we were quite successful. When I started, I had just myself. Um, I was the director. I had um, another GS-15 from the FBI and a GS-15 from the CIA. The three of us got to put this together um, as best we could, as best we felt it needed to be put together. And we did. Um, when we're, when I was done um, in 2007, I started in 2003 with that. In 2007, we finished. Well, I finished. Um, we had, let's see, we had 1,700 translators working in 80 different languages from 48 states. And we were about to branch into um, working overseas. We got to write some new capabilities, um, um, authorities, you could say, for how to make this sort of thing work. And it was, it was like one of the coolest jobs I ever got to do. And so that was another thing I'd gotten to because of my language experience, my technology experience, working with Capitol Hill, um, understanding the Bureau, working with folks over at CIA, and also being an NSA for a person, I, I could also speak NSA. So that really helped. Everything builds on everything else. And I found that in my career. So um, you don't throw anything away. You do the best job where you can, no matter where they put you. So it's been a lot of fun. It's a sense of adventure. And I could say that it hasn't always worked out to my advantage um, when I've taken these choices. Sometimes you don't get the promotion that you thought you would get when you thought you needed it or wanted it. Um, and sometimes um, it was not a good fit in the organization you were you were working in. And so these are the things that you understand along the way. It's a trade off. It can't all be perfect. Um, but boy, was it fun. I remember when you were setting up that virtual translation center, and that was a very entrepreneurial uh, in, in, in activity. Yes, um, it sounds like that was really pivotal in 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 in, um, in your success in the positions that came after that. Yeah, it turned out really well. So uh, you mentioned politics earlier, and, and I can't um, help but think that we're only a couple of days away from a presidential election. And you and I served at NSA at a time when. Um, Fortunately, it was very apolitical and politics very rarely entered into our into our daily discourse or our daily uh, uh, decision making. Mm -hmm. um, but you're in the shadow of the White House now. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how have you ad adapted to that um, political culture? I, you, you served on Capitol Hill, so you were somewhat familiar with the politi po political environment. But um, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on that. Oh, certainly. As with most government civil servants, we realize that. You keep working in the government, sooner or later you may be working for somebody you didn't vote for. That's beside the point. You have a job to do. It's probably a hard but very important job to do, so focus on the job that you need to do. These are the things that we, that we convey to our junior workforce, and we live it every day. Stay focused on the job that you're doing. Um, political comments and those sorts of things may be felt, but need not be spoken in the work environment in the same way that... That the same thing that we practiced up at the NSA, um, don't bring that to work. Um, again, we do have a job to do, and everyone respects that. Yes, um, when you're near your policymakers, your decision makers, um, you're much closer to the heat um, mm -hmm. than you mm -hmm. were before. Right. <laughs> and, and you have to learn how to take that in stride. In the past, we were quite insulated. When you're working at NSA or you're even working at CIA or the Bureau, you're insulated by several layers of, of bureaucracy that um, come between you and them. And you don't have to worry too much. Now, it's a very flat organization. Everybody knows you by your first name. And you know them. I mean, I'm standing in the hallway talking to people. And the Secretary of the Treasury walks by. He says, good morning, Everett. I say, good morning, sir. And everything goes quite, quite normally. And in my boss's office last week, after we finished our um, weekly uh, meeting with the other Deputy Assistant Secretaries, um, Marine One pulls in. We can hear it. And it lands on the South Lawn. We can see it. 
And so um, we walked over to my boss's window and stood and looked out as the president walks out and gets on Marine One. It gets up, takes off, and we go back to it's another day at the office for us. Um, it's getting used to that, you know, seeing those kinds of things take place that you normally wouldn't see. In other times, you're walking out of work right into the middle of a um, demonstration. Um, this is Washington, D.C. This is the United States of America, and there are demonstrations um, right in front of the White House. We're right next door to the White House. And so um, I have many times been caught up in a roving demonstration that just walked past, and I had to walk through the crowd to get to the metro <laughs> to come home. <laughs> Again, very normal. Take it in stride. Um, don't act silly. And um, it's... Again, it's, it's a different kind of normal, but at this point in my career, you never, you, you never get tired of the White House, the Treasury Building, um, the setting, knowing where you are and knowing that you, have, that you get to play a role in these kinds of things at this level. And so for that, i um, extremely proud. The, um, sometimes the demonstrations aren't that good, <laughs> um, but you live with that. And sometimes the politics inside the hallways aren't that good. But I get to mentor our workforce and talk to them on a regular basis. And we all keep each other focused on the job that we have to do. Well, you've given us a really good sense of the environment you're in today. Are there any interesting uh, additional stories or uh, just interesting activities that have occurred that you want to share with us? Yes. Actually, there is an organization that we get to work with called the Treasury Executive Office of Asset Forfeiture. Um, our internal shorthand for this is tee off. If you've ever heard of bad guys getting grabbed up and all of their stuff being confiscated and, and being given to the, you know, it's now the property of the United States government or the property of the United States Treasury, this is the organization where all that stuff goes. These guys, um, colleagues of mine, and the, these guys get to, um, let's see, on behalf of the U.S. government, they own property, jewelry, artwork, fast cars, fast boats, um, livestock, and, <laughs> and, and a, a very impressive clothing line uh, <laughs> of things, stuff that they have confiscated over the years. Um, normally when they confiscate it, they are, you know, they, you know, it's a, there's a court case pending. And so the stuff is held in evidence. And then once the um, case is resolved, they have to liquidate those assets. Pretty much they sell them at auction. And so the Treasury Department works with the Marshall Service and other places to auction off as much as they possibly can. If after a while the stuff cannot be auctioned, it is often destroyed. So try to off auction off as much as we can. So we had a situation a few years ago with Hurricane Maria. This is roughly 2017 that came through the Caribbean, came through Texas and did quite a bit of damage, um, serious damage. People lost homes. They lost everything. And normally the, um, you know, we all heard, you know, the cries for people don't have nothing and please help us. The director of TIOF, who was a colleague of mine, um, told me at the time, we were in the process, we, the Treasury Department, were in the process of um, prosecuting a, what do they call that, a, a knockoff um, ring, um, counterfeit clothing. And so they had confiscated quite a bit of counterfeit clothing and other materials. And they had um, a number of plaintiffs on a list and um, a lot of stuff that, needs, that needed to be you know, dealt with as far as evidence goes. The director of TIOF thought, well, you know, I'm seeing all these people in need and I'm wondering how we can help. There are people you know, crying out for need and we have, we, we've got stuff here at the Department of the Treasury. And so he asked his lawyers, how do we do this? And the lawyers gave the perfect lawyer answer, we can't do that. Well, why not? Well, we've never done that before. And there are no rules that says that we can do that. And so the director of TIOS says, let's figure out how to do that. And so in time, we were able to um, get the plaintiffs to um, sign off on, on the property. We, we kept a, a large portion back for evidence sake, but they would um, relinquish rights to the rest of the um, counterfeit property. And we had asked that um, once they relinquished those rights, we had to um, we would give it to the people who needed it wherever they needed it. And all but one of the um, of the people who had you know who had all but one of the plaintiffs um, signed off. And so we 
um, the secretary, not the secretary, but the um, head of TIOF with the secretary's support, went forward and says, all right, to your dear FEMA, we are sending you 23 semi-tractor truck trailers of materials that includes men's, women's, and children's clothing of all types, shoes, hats, scarves, trousers, underwear. Um, we are also sending you um, generators. We're sending you flatbed trucks. We're sending you cars. We actually, we actually we have, a, um, we have a fleet of about 7,000 cars that we've confiscated <laughs> sitting in a warehouse in Arizona that, um, we can, <laughs> that we use from time to time. Um, we're sending all of these things to you on behalf of the um, U.S. government. He worked it out through FEMA, where the stuff got in there. But that was, quite a, that was quite a story that none of us really knew. It had never been done before, um, but we were able to make that happen. Um, and in a similar vein, when the, um, when the storm hit Puerto Rico, we were able to send um, several hundred generators um, using the same procedure to having um, the plaintiffs in the case sign off on confiscated materials, in this case, generators, um, brand names. And we were able to put those on a boat. And we actually, since we own boats, um, <laughs> put them on a boat and got them down to Puerto Rico at the same time. The Treasury Department was aware of this, and the um, public affairs wanted to um, really put the story out. The um, head of TIOF says, actually, I'd rather you not. Mm -hmm. He says, I would um, I do this because I believe it's the right thing to do. It was a risk. The head of TIOF told his um, workforce that we're going to do this. We've never done this before. Um, but to make sure that if anything goes wrong, only one person goes down for this, he said, I will sign every document that requires a signature. None of you in the staff will have to sign the documentation. And that worked out well. Uh, for me, I consider that a bit of leadership, that you apply at the right time in the right place. And we did it. But the um, director of TIOF says that if this story really goes public, I won't do it again. Um, because chances are there'll be a thousand reasons why we can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't even try. But it was a very good story to do. And we all sat up a little bit straighter in our chairs, having heard that we were able to help. The, and as I'd mentioned at the start, if this information, if, if, the, um, if the materials aren't sold off, they're destroyed. So we otherwise would have destroyed all of this stuff that could really help people who really needed it. And so we were able to do that. Um, so that was, that was a pretty cool story. And not everything, that, that's not the kind of thing that you would hear about what the Treasury Department would do. Sounds like the right outcome at the, at the right time. Wonderful yeah. story, yeah. So uh, in the, I think the final question I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, Everett, uh, AFIO has many retired uh, intelligence officers as its membership, obviously, but we also have quite a few students. Uh, undergraduate and graduate students who join AFIO because they're interested in or anticipating a career in the intelligence community. And many of us on the board and throughout AFIO are mentors for these young people. And I know, I know that you've been a wonderful uh, mentor to young people your entire career. I wonder, just based on your own career, the experiences that you've had, the, the current environment that we're in, what kind of advice are you giving the young people that you're mentoring today who are considering a career in the intelligence community? Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I tell them is to be open, um, be open to new possibilities, um, new vistas, um, not just close to the job that you're being hired to do. Do that job. Do it well. But since people normally have more than one side to them, more than one facet to them, working in the government enables you to develop those facets as well. And so be open to those sorts of things and be able to take a risk when it's, when it's, you know, seems like a good time to do that. Um, also, I tell them that the learning never stops. It's just the scenery that changes. So always be open to learning new things, things that you're not good at. Um, don't worry about it. Practice, get better at it. Um, for my colleagues who are mid-career, as they go into the senior ranks, I tell them that as a, as a senior, senior executive service, sooner or later, you're going to be put in charge of something that you have no background in whatsoever. Um, this is where it's important to know who you are, to be comfortable in your own skin and know what you need to know to learn that new thing so that you can lead it, so that you can manage it. You're not hired to be the technician, the super expert. You're hired to lead the organization. And so understand what your role is 
and be able to do that. Um, for, your, for the younger people, I also tell them, I look them straight in the eye and I say, go home. And then I tell them at the end of the day, go home. It's important to have good life balance to the job that you're going to do because our work is so interesting and there's so much of it. You could really put in a lot of time doing it, but this job will never love you back. And so you've got to put in the time. I tell them, if you don't have a life, go get one. You're going to need it. I said, if you have kids that um, soccer games, go to those soccer games, go to those swim meets, um, go to the Brownie Cub Scouts, you know, <laughs> do what you're going to do. Go on those road trips. Um, our daughter was a soccer player um, at NC State. And we went on those road trips and um, it was great. It was rainy. It was miserable, but we were there. And those moments go by so fast. And so I tell them, you know, also pace yourself. Um, don't be in such a hurry to be the director of the agency. Um, <laughs> if that job comes to you, it'll come. But in the meantime, you've got other things to do. And so, again, pay attention to where you are. Another thing has to do with working in the community. Um, there are different cultures um, um, in different agencies that um, I've gotten to learn. I'm, I'm a language guy by training. And so I've learned a lot of the lingo and ritual dances of each of the um, agencies. And it enables you to communicate well, <laughs> enables you to get things done um, and not be judgmental you know, by walking in and saying, well, over at this place, we did it that way. And so why can't we do it that way here? Well, here is not there. Um, understand <laughs> where you are and how that stuff um, is to work. Um, again, be comfortable have fun, um, work hard, and continue to ask questions. Because often the answer is known for want of the right question. And sometimes we will assume that you know something, but if you don't um, speak up, then you won't know it. So there's, these are the kinds of things that I um, talk to people about uh, mentoring both the mid and um, junior um, career folks. And I'm finding that they're the ones that are most inquisitive. Sometimes um, the more senior you get, the fewer questions you may ask. Mm -hmm. and um, that's not always great because those are the times when you should be asking even more questions. Like, what have I gotten myself into this time? <laughs> or how bad is this going to be? Or if you're like me coming from somewhere inside the DOD and then you go into um, Treasury like I did in 2015, well, the, um, the elections happened in 2016. And so I got to see an administration changeover and all of the things that go with that and understanding that the role I played as a, um, as a Deputy Assistant Secretary um, with the workforce, who was in this case looking for leadership. Um, they're looking for guidance. I've got a great team of other DASs that work with me, as well as the um, assistant secretary. Um, they're all great folks, fine Americans, um, all committed to do it, but um, not perfect. And so we work together as a team and we do this job with people. And those are the, you know, most, the most things that I tell people also that I, um, a sense of humor is critical. Um, you're going to need that almost all the time. <laughs> so um, bring it with you. Those are, those are the things that I um, mentor others about. Oh, Everett, that was, that was uh, so interesting and um, so, so humorous and so you having, having worked with you and I really, really enjoyed it. I know our, our, uh, our student members, when they, when they watch this piece of the, of the broadcast, are going to get so much out of it. I really, really thank you for doing this. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. I enjoyed the session. I know it's going to be enjoyed by all of our AFIO membership. And I'm going to now hand the baton back to Jim Hughes. Hey, thank you, Deborah. The pleasure has been mine. And I thank you. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. Everett, um, what a great life of service to the nation. Words of wisdom and wonderful stories. Um, <laughs> I want to thank uh, both Deborah Bonani and Everett for today's session. Uh, I'm sure our membership will uh, love watching it. And I have a sneaking suspicion that ha Everett has other stories to tell. So we'll try to get him back again very soon to tell a few more of them. That's all today from AFIO Now. We'll be seeing you again soon.